Today is May 15th, 2018, and uh, my name is Allison Thompson. I'm the director at Marshall Public Library, and I'm here today with uh, Bob Miller, and we're here talking today for the Smithsonian uh, Museum on Main Street, Crossroads for Rural Change, and Bob is going to tell us a little bit about his family history um, and um, how agriculture has changed for them over the years. You know, I, I think about agriculture, and even um, since, you know, I was a child to now, and then if you talk to my parents and, and my grandparents, you they, they, they share these stories of living on a farm and how every family had a farm. They had the garden, they had the livestock, they had their own field and equipment, and it was very independent yes. at the time. And, and um, it, it really was very common for lots of people to have all of those dynamics, including the barns and the silos and, and things like that. But now, when you go out into the country and you go down a gravel road, you don't see those, I mean, just the landscape also has really changed. And so we're just really curious about hearing your perspective and hearing how your family farm from your grandparents to sort of present day has changed in both agriculture and with with your livestock. Okay. All right. Um, yes. Um, my family started in the uh, late 1800s. Uh, my great-grandfather come from uh, Germany and uh, come up the uh, Wabash and uh, first settled in Vincennes, Indiana and then uh, moved on up to uh, Clark County and um, uh, his farm was a uh, about a mile uh, from where our farmstead is right now and it was uh, like you said very uh, it was an agrarian society uh, everybody um, everybody farmed uh, and everybody had a small farm they had their gardens they had their orchards they had their livestock and they raised their families that way uh, on my great-grandfather's farm uh, they finally tore down the old cellar a few years ago but it was a stone cellar and I remember uh, playing in that as a, as a child um, and then uh, that was my great-grandfather then my grandfather uh, moved to where our homestead is or where our farmstead is right now and uh, just kind of the same thing there was always the the garden the barns the the sheds uh, I always asked my uh, dad why my great-grandfather settled in this part of the country and he said it was because it reminded him of Germany you know you had to have woods you had to have uh, for livestock, for shade, for water. Uh, you wanted a little tillable ground. Uh, I don't know why they did not go up and settle on the flat prairie lands of Illinois where I would love to farm today, but uh, the, this part of the country reminded them of the old country. And uh, so they, uh, they settled here. And again, back to their gardens, their fruit, a lot of uh, orchards, fruit trees back in the 18, late 1800s and early 1900s. Uh, all the canning and preserving that you did to to uh, provide, take care of your, your family. Uh, then my grandfather took over the farm, um, um, and because of the depression, he lost part of his farm, which uh, kind of instilled in us how to be uh, good stewards, because my dad was a very, very conservative uh, person and farmer and did not want to take chances because he grew up as a child in the Depression and saw what that was like and how hard it was to uh, uh, get through those times but it seemed like people in the agriculture again were still sustainable enough to to handle that. Also you go back into uh, uh, my father's generation uh, there were eight kids in the family so you had your own workforce that was just the norm. You, the more kids you had, the more livestock you could take care of and things like, like that. Uh, but my dad then uh, got out of the service in uh, uh, 1955, uh, came home, uh, was married already. Uh, uh, I was born before dad got out of the service, uh, came home to take over part of the family farm and had a small uh, had a small milk cow herd, uh, milking shorthorns, were, which were not the most prolific milk givers, but they, he started milking a few cows, uh, sold cream. My mom sold cream and eggs in town. Uh, 
Uh, I hear those stories all the time about you kids don't know how tough it was because it was just cream money and egg money. That's how we survived. But still, even in the 50s and early 60s, the, there were still uh, the family farms. Uh, there was still that generation coming, coming back, to the, back to the farm. And then as, we, uh, as I grew up as a, a child, um, very labor-intensive. Very, very labor-intensive. I mean, I have three other brothers, so my mom and dad had a workforce of four boys. And uh, you did everything by hand. And the way you grew the farm was just by adding a few more acres or adding a few more head of livestock, whether it was chickens, uh, hogs, or, or cattle. But we were very, very work oriented uh, and uh, I'll, I'll talk a little bit later on then about how the practices have changed but as we've gone forward then uh, into my generation um, agriculture changed in the fact that um, more outside jobs were available and for instance I have one brother that said I don't want to work this hard and so he left the farm when he got out of high school um, I have another brother I farm with that he worked in the outside world for a little bit and says, I don't like that, I'm going to come back to the farm. And then my younger brother, he always had the desire to farm. So there are three of us in, uh, in our farm partnership right now. And with that being said, then labor, the labor force changed and uh, young people began to leave the farm for better things in, in towns and in, and in cities. Um, so from that aspect then, once the labor pool had left, then farming began to change and become a lot more mechanized, a lot more industrialized, uh, uh, a lot more labor-saving conveniences were, were added into that because the labor force was, was not there. And then it also come to the fact that uh, we became so uh, especially in the last 10 to 20 years, um, we became uh, more of a um, profit-oriented center where uh, margins began to become squeezed more and so you had to operate on more volumes and, and agriculture, like any business, is very capital-oriented and so that kind of limits a lot of people where they where they go. But I, as I grew up, we always had the garden and the milk cow and the chickens and, and things like that. But as our farm changed with labor and began to change with technology and the new way of doing things came along, a lot of those aspects were gone. Um, it's, it's cool to have your own garden, but when you get focused on other aspects, you didn't have the, have the time to put it in the garden. And as the generations have changed, farm wives were not so inclined to do gardens and that kind of stuff. They found jobs in town. And, and all of a sudden, the, uh, the very homogeneous thing of uh, mom and dad sitting on the back porch making decisions about the business kind of went to the wayside and it changed uh, 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 just the whole perspective on, on farming. Um, living on a gravel road and that, that, that feel good feeling, if you want to do that, I still live on a gravel road. <laughs> if you like the dust and the dirt and everything like that, I still live on a gravel road. But uh, uh, no, the landscape has changed. The barns became outdated. The machinery got larger. You, you could not utilize the barns as they were put up years ago and what they were meant for. And so you um, have done away with those with those things. Um, I might also add that as the landscape changed and the buildings came down and and kids left the farm, they went to town, got jobs, and those in turn now have come back because the labor force went, the livestock went out of the the countryside, and now they've come back in to build homes out in the rural areas, and that throws a whole nother perspective on the agriculture scene because now we're dealing with with urban neighbors and uh, uh, just you know uh, as livestock expands into uh, larger operations and and we have young people that have left the farm come back and built their nice home and then somebody decides to build a livestock operation a half a mile away they get up in arms which is it's understandable but 
we have to raise food somewhere, and, and I can get on that soapbox and go a whole, uh, a whole other direction. But as people move out in the countryside, and uh, we, have, we have neighbors now that plant fruit trees right along the edge of the fields, and that's a whole other animal you have to deal with when you start tilling crops and using chemicals and things like that with their fruit trees. And so we have to be very, very aware of our neighbor situation now. But a lot of the barns and the buildings came down to make way for new and improved ways of doing things. Uh, um, I'm 64 years old and I do not want to use a scoop shovel and a pitchfork anymore. I'm sorry, that's just the way it is. And, um, and uh, my offspring, which I have three daughters, they all went to the big city. And so they're not there to do, to do the work, that, that labor work. And uh, you, can, you can increase your farm a whole lot better more than just actually physically working anymore. It's more of a business mindset. And I think that's probably one of the big changes is that agriculture went to a business mindset rather than a lifestyle. Um, everybody's always envisioned that farming is a, it's a lifestyle. And it has, it has been up to now a certain point, but now it has to be run as a business uh, if you want it to grow and succeed. Now, if you want to have your small family farm or your, your specific area where you want to do something, those small, there's still a place for those small family farms, but uh, we become very industrialized, and so we've had to change those things. Um, so. And tell us about some of those changes as far as how your farm has grown over the years. Okay. Um, to, to stay in the business and, and, and to stay competitive and to continue the farm because you see how so many of those smaller family farms died away. Yeah. And, and so how did that happen? And, you know, was it just the jobs or? It was, I think some of it was the jobs pulling, pulling young people away from the farm and young people, they began to see that there's other things in life than hard work. And uh, when you are, back when I grew up and, and, and in our operation today, dealing with row crops and livestock that is it's it's six days it's seven days a week with livestock those animals need to be taken care of seven days a week and it's hard to plan the vacation time because you don't know how mother nature is going to react in planting and harvesting crops and and so young people they they left that said there's something better and so that changed that whole that whole format on doing things but um, when when I grew up I've, I've rented a couple of farms from older farmers when I got started that they would have a 100, uh, 150 acre or a 200 acre farm and they'd raise their families. Uh, today, uh, it just takes hundreds if not thousands of acres and instead of hundreds of head of animals, it takes thousands because of the, the, uh, the margin on each one of those. And our lifestyles have changed. Uh, we. When I was a kid growing up, you know, you very seldom had the things that your 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 city kids, your city friends had, you know. And so uh, I think once we got a taste of that, that kind of changed that, and and our lifestyles have have changed. But um, just to go back into uh, uh, to to our farm, uh, I grew up as a as, as a boy. Uh, once my dad decided to get rid of the, the, the milking cows, we went into raising swine, raising hogs, and we did it the old way. We converted old chicken houses, we converted old barns, we, did a, we raised a lot of animals outside, uh, you know, in nature, uh, and you dealt with nature, you dealt with rain, you dealt with heat, you dealt with cold, uh, and then all of a sudden in the, uh, the late 60s, the modernization of livestock came along where we started building buildings and barns and putting animals in there uh, and becoming more efficient. Uh, and when you become more efficient with your labor, you become more efficient in controlling the atmosphere. And so it just kind of continued to grow. So the livestock, I've, I've seen so many changes in the livestock go from a, a very labor intense uh, part of agriculture to a more capital intense, but with that, your, your animal husbandry habits and your training for employees has had to, had to change to meet those demands. And, um, but um, as we've got into uh, confinement livestock, we can control that environment a lot better. We can produce a product a lot quicker and faster. And with that, we, we've changed. And so I have gone through in my lifetime of very much hand labor raising livestock to the early modernization of, of confinement systems until now. Uh, 
my brothers and I are exiting the livestock business because our facilities uh, have been up for 40 years and they're, they are literally deteriorating and falling apart. But the next generation in our family, my niece and nephew, uh, they are going to come back in and they're going to put up a, a huge barn uh, that will hold about 4,000 animals. And it will be, um, it will be a contract barn. Uh, trying to manage the risk of markets and inputs and everything else, they have decided to, to make their way in agriculture work as they are going to sell their labor to somebody else. And it's, I think that's the option that, that uh, is going to be most feasible for them uh, right now. Uh, so that's how livestock has changed and, and numbers and confinement. Uh, from the agronomy side, that really gets me excited because I, uh, I try to stay on the cutting edge of uh, the new technology and, and I love it. Um, from going to a, a 30 horsepower tractor and, and a two bottom plow and sitting outside in the sun and the dust and the dirt all day to actually getting a 100 horsepower tractor with a radio on the fender and, and going from a two bottom plow to a five bottom plow to, to today we, uh, we have tractors on our farm that range 500 to 600 horsepower. We pull 40 to 60 foot implements. Uh, the tractor that I, that I do the planting the crops with is uh, a 340 horsepower tractor with leather interior and air conditioning and uh, uh, a $3,000 light package. So late at night when I'm out there working, it's like there's a little town moving through the, through the field. Um, we've also adapted all the GPS technology that uh, uh, not only steers the, the tractor, but it also runs my planter. Um, gives me my planting population, it, I, can, I, can, I can increase it, I can slow it down, uh, just so many things. Matter of fact, uh, uh, I use, I've, I've gone to the point now where I use an iPad that uh, the uh, GPS signal goes to a cell phone tower and the cell phone tower beams it to my iPad, my iPad Bluetooths it to my tractor and that's how it steers itself through the field. So uh, uh, sometimes I feel like I need to throw a little dust and dirt on my face when I go home at night to make my wife think I've been doing something. But with the technology uh, like that, um, we can work longer hours. We can farm more acres because we're not actually physically having to drive the tractor. We can, we sit back, I, I sit back, I cross my legs just like this. I watch the monitor because I know it's going to the end of the field. It beeps, it tells me I want to get to the end. I push a button, I raise up my implement, I turn around, I hit a button, it gets back on the, the same track. And I use that same track year after year after year after year. But it allows me to, to monitor what's going on with the planter. It also allows me to check emails, text messages, I can watch the markets, I can communicate with other people, I can multitask a whole lot of things because I'm not physically having to drive, drive that tractor. And so we have all of that technology in, in all of our equipment. Uh, our tractors that we do tillage work with, that we till the ground with, they have the same thing. And so they can watch the implements better. We can work longer hours. We're not as fatigued at, uh, at the end of a long day, which allows us to do, to do more. And then we take that technology into our fertilization. Uh, uh, we do what we call grid sampling. That way, uh, we're not just throwing fertilizer out there. We are putting it in certain areas. Uh, then we take that technology and my harvesting equipment. I monitor my, my harvesting results on a foot by foot by foot basis. And so my crop or my agronomist can layer those all together with soil test, with my yield production. We can layer that all together. What, what I expect to raise next year, and then we build programs for fertility, uh, and so we variable rate our fertilizer, we variable rate our, our chemicals. Uh, so the technology aspect from just the, the GPS and everything like that has just changed it, it so much. I'm really excited about it. And then I know uh, you also said you want to talk to me, uh, I want to talk about the technology of the seed aspect. Um, we in agriculture, have had some issues the last several years and still do on occasion uh, about the genetically modified crops and 
how do we handle those things, it still comes back into production of, of food products um, that we can get in a big discussion about whether it's right or it's wrong. But it has helped us to use genetically modified or engineered. Seed corn is a hybrid. You take this plant, this plant, you get a you you take the pollen and you take the silks and you get a hybrid corn plant. With the technology of, of GMOs and things like that and adding traits, you just enhance those. And so um, years ago we used to use insecticide on our fields, uh, put it actually in the ground, and now we use traded hybrids that that technology is it's a just a, a stepped up protein. There's no chemicals going into the ground to to control insects. Um, and we use those things to increase production because increased production gives us the edge to compete in the marketplace because the market's going to allow us or give us a price. And if we can produce more bushels uh, on less acres, uh, work with the environment and those kind of things, it just adds value to us and keeps us keeps us in the forefront and, and ahead of, of the competition. Uh, and so those types of things have really, really helped. And we use more, more chemicals that are centered for particular weeds and particular crops rather than just a broad <coughs> spectrum of everything. And I've always, I love to visit with urban people as they go to their local hardware store and they buy all this stuff they put on their yards. I don't know if they're using GPS technology and managing it that way or they just, they go buy a bag, they buy a spreader, they spread it on your yard and, well, I got a little ex extra left over, so I'll just put a little extra on it, you know, and then it rains and it goes somewhere else, too. So, but that's, those are personal issues that, that I can talk about. But uh, that's just how those things have changed. We've gone from uh, uh, my grandfather picking corn by hand to machines that would pick one or two rows at a time. They always said years ago, if, if a good corn... A good corn husker could, could husk a hundred bushel of corn in a day by hand. He was doing really good. There's days last fall that I harvested 30 to 35,000 bushel of corn in a day. And so I've gone from two row corn pickers that pull it down through the machine and you've got the ears and you put it in a corn crib to a machine that shells the product. It's just amazed. People are just amazed when they come ride with me and they go, wow. It, it took this ear, it brought it through here, and I look back here, and the grain is already threshed and it's cleaned, and the, the residue is going out the back end. Um, that's, it's just an amazing thing how we, how we do that. And then that has also changed the way we, we handle grain, and we have, uh, we have 300,000 bushel of grain storage on our farm, and it's, you know, it's, it's all controlled electronically. Um, it's just, it's just an amazing thing. And then from that aspect, and then this is, that was the fun part of agriculture. The tough part of agriculture is deciding when to market that. Uh, sometimes farmers become very personally involved with the crop that they raise. And they, they don't look at it sometimes from a business side, but they always think, I got to get the most that I can. And sometimes that's not the best business, the business approach to it. But, but market, the, the labor aspect anymore is, it's there. The, the, I, the difficult aspect of agriculture is the business side of it, making the right decision at the right time. And that gets hard to do when we have so many worldly influences. We not only deal with Mother Nature, I was just on the way in, I was talking to, the, to, my, to my grain broker, and he said, uh, these rains are really kind of slowing down. And they're talking some hot, dry weather coming in in the next 10 days. It's like, so how does that affect my marketing? Hmm, you know. It rains one day and everybody in Chicago thinks the crops made, the markets go down. Then all of a sudden, you, what really helps is to get a, a, a newscaster go, man, it's really dry out here in Iowa. And then the markets go crazy. And, and, so we have, and those are the tough things on how to manage that aspect of it. Working, I can do that. The, the technology, I can handle that. But it's those day-to-day -day business decisions as you look down the road to say, I got, this is what I got to do to stay in, in business. So. And, and you make a really good point because I think that is the dynamic that has 
um, caused either farms to succeed or not succeed. And there's been some, you know, some uncontrollable factors that unfortunately have been sort of the demise of some farms. Oh, oh yes, and I so, mean. you know, especially, you know, um, in their infancy as they're trying to grow, you know, you hear these stories of, well, they shouldn't have bought all that ground, or, you know, maybe they shouldn't have bought all that equipment, and but there's this fine line, well, how do I harvest if I don't have the big it's, equipment, and how do I stay competitive? So talk a little bit about the dynamic of, of some of the success stories you've seen and some of the failures and, and some of the reasons maybe why, okay. you know, and I think, again, s s there might be some luck that is involved in that, and, and maybe not. There, maybe not. Maybe there is. It is. All right, I'll go back. Um, uh, as I said, my father grew up in the Depression, and so he was very conservative in his thought process as, as he grew the farm and then as the next generation come on. And we all know how the next generation is. The next generation has always got wild ideas. they got different ideas, and they're going to approach things from a whole other perspective. I'm thankful that as I started in agriculture, in the in the early to mid 70s, agriculture was really good. It was still it was still uh, work hard, more animals, more acres, and you do okay. Then, as we got into the late 70s, early 80s, interest rates come up. There was an embargo thrown on. The agriculture scene changed in a hurry, and all of a sudden, that aspect of just grow, grow, grow began to stop. And my dad had pretty well kept his thumb on us boys and would not allow us to go and overextend ourselves borrowing capital to expand because back in the late 70s, if you didn't, if you didn't buy a piece of property or a piece of equipment this year, you knew it was going to be more next year. Mm -hmm. Well, then all of a sudden, farmers, especially farmers, growing farmers with the next generation coming on, they probably borrowed too much, and all of a sudden, we also know what happened is interest rates went up. And that's where it's based on your cash flow. And when interest rates went up, there were a lot of, uh, a lot of young guys exited the, li uh, exited the agriculture business because of high interest rates. They were just forced out. Banks forced them out. So I was very fortunate to the fact that I had a father that was very conservative and held us held me and my brothers down to doing what we could only do. And we ran our operation for years, for years without borrowing any money. That also comes back to our personal lifestyles. Uh, you tell your wife and your kids, no, we're buying a new combine, so we're not taking a vacation, we're not going to buy a new car, and we're not going to do those things. because you are building your business and that's what agriculture has really always been is about building your own business and uh, going that direction then uh, we went through the we went through that late 70s and the 80s and we we kind of we flushed out a lot of the agri those those guys in agriculture were not financially sound did they borrow too much did they buy too much at that point in time when they did it no but as circumstances changed, as interest rates goes up, as the embargo came on, as the world changed, that changed agriculture. And so it puts you in a bind. And sometimes it's, you just have to face the fact in any business, in any business, that we can't keep going this direction. Then um, um, there is some luck to it. But it basically comes back to... Um, good management practices, good understanding your financial records. Um, that's one thing where my, my father's generation was, the business aspect of it was not the important thing. Just the actual physical work was the important thing. As I have uh, grown, grown older in, in agriculture, I understand the business concept of it, and you have to run it as a business, you don't become personally attached to that bushel of corn or anything else, and, and you can't sit there and say, I'm going to hit a home run every time because you will strike out. That Kind of like Babe Ruth, he hit a lot of home runs, but he struck out a lot. So you have to use business sense, and I think that's where today especially uh, agriculture has to be a business sense oriented uh, uh, way of, of doing things. Um, you, I, I've been successful on, in some people's eyes, but it's because of 
being raised very conservative, watching the business side of things, working hard, sacrificing other things uh, along the way. Uh, I see young farmers wanting to start out and there, there's dues to pay, just like with everything else. And it's, I love I, her I husband. Felt, I was going to say, I felt a little personal there. It, it is. It's, I just, I love this young couple. They, well, they, he gave my husband a three acre farm. Oh. And I said, Bob, you're killing me with a three acre I, farm. I can't farm it, okay? My equipment's too big and I'm not going to mess with it. And so I, I give it to her husband. Which, that and that was probably, I shouldn't have done that because it's not good. It doesn't make good business sense. But he's it a young. He, you're, you're talking business. I know. I, that, yeah, that's it. So, but, but off the record, I'll talk to you some more about that. Yeah, but um, but uh, it, it but it is, and and at, at my at my stage in life, uh, I have I've done the sweat, I've done the blood, I've done the crying. I've I've I this is uh, this is my uh, let's see, gosh, eighteen this is my forty six, forty seventh. This is my forty eighth crop year. I've seen it all. I've seen the floods. I've seen the droughts. I've seen hot weather, dry weather, cold weather, and I've I've persevered. Uh, that comes back a lot to my character as a person and everything. Um, but um, there again, it has to be so business oriented today. And as farms get larger, I mean, um, there's farms farming tens of thousands of acres, and they handle it from a purely business side and um, it makes it difficult I, there are there are young farmers that look at my operation and go man I wish I could be like them they have everything I look at operations that are five ten times larger than me and go man I wish I was like that but then again you know what at my age I'm thinking no I'll let the next generation worry about that it's just uh, it's up to them to do it the next generation um, it's hard to go out and just jump into agriculture on your own anymore, if not impossible to do. You have got to have a start either from a family that's in the business or from a gentleman that is retiring, has no offspring and is willing to step up and to not let his life, his lifetime of work go away and help a young person get started. That is about the only two ways to to get started in agriculture and, today. And you made a good point about the large-scale farmers. And how has that impacted sort of these small to medium farms, you know, that which I would say even are close to 2,000 acres, but you're looking at these big farmers who, like you're saying, they have 10, 20, maybe 30,000 acres right. that they're tending to. So what, how, how does that impact these farm families who they've made the decision, it's been in the family for generations, they're, but they're, they're competing against you know these these large scale farmers, and, and it makes it difficult to to succeed. In yeah, some and this is this is uh, I mean this is this is how the agricultural landscape has changed. A lot of a, a lot of people have had a grandparent or a great grandparent grow up on a farm, and the farm's been part of their heritage. I farm for for some people now that are the second generation. They came to Grandpa's farm, and now they own Grandpa's farm, but they don't come back to Grandpa's farm. And so that personal, that personal relationship is gone, and so they just want a return on their investment. They don't have that connectivity, and that's, that's one thing that a lot of people in agriculture face is that they don't have that connection. And so when this large-scale operation decides they want to come in and they just they call that that uh, that landowner in New Jersey and go hey we're in the area I can guarantee you X amount of dollars to the acre I will send you a check once a year twice a year and we'll 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 take care of it and we'll just go from there and they go well that sounds pretty cool you know because I'm gonna get a two percent or three percent return on my investment that's okay you know and um, and so you lose that now with that being said when there are those large operations that come in like that it also opens up opportunities for young people or a farmer to be able to drive a tractor plant crops till the soil smell the dirt be it he just works for a paycheck mm -hmm. and so but it does give the opportunity I, I know a young man right now that him and his sons 
worked for one of those large operations and they turned over 9,000 acres for him with machinery to farm and manage and to take care of. Now, if financial things turn around and all of a sudden this huge conglomerate farm can't make it, then this young, this young man and his two sons will be looking for employment somewhere else. But right now, it, it's really good. And um, as times have changed, it's like any other business, as some businesses grow larger, they become more efficient. Uh, the young man that farms this 50,000 acres right now, is, he has his own agronomy staff. He has his own marketing staff. He has somebody working on that all the time. So it has become a, not a mom and dad, not a family lifestyle, but it has become a big business and it's managed as that big business. But So it, it, it takes away from the family. Mm -hmm. It takes away from that closeness, that, uh, uh, that good feeling that we all like to have that we think agriculture is but it's getting farther and farther away from that as the generations are, are removed. Um, I, made, I made mention that we do have a next generation coming back to the farm. I have a, a, a niece that's in agriculture retail. Uh, I have a nephew that has finished up his ag degree and will be back to take on the production side of agriculture. But I myself, I have three daughters and one daughter and her husband want to continue on with their outside income to purchase farmland to keep the, the farm going down for the next generation or two. So uh, that's really exciting for me because I thought, oh, it's done and it's over with, I'll turn it over to my nephew, but now that I have part of my family that has left the farm, they want to come back and still continue to see it grow and continue on, so that's, that makes me happy from that aspect. And, and I can and I can relate to those rule changes because I don't feel those personal connections. You know, I can hear my mom tell the stories of growing up on a farm, but I didn't grow up on a farm. Can you take us down memory lane and just share some of that nostalgia with us? What are some of your favorite memories and maybe even some funny or disappointing ones about growing up on the farm? You talked about some of the sacrifices. Um, you talk about some of the physical work and how hard that was. And, so t kind of give us a sense of, of, of what that felt like as a, as a kid with some personal stories, if you don't mind. Oh, I don't mind. Yeah. If you don't mind listening, I don't mind sharing it with you. Um, so, grew up uh, with uh, three younger brothers. Uh, very, We were very work-oriented. Um, there, we did not have, as we got older and as we increased our, our livestock part of the operation, um, Gosh, I mean, uh, the summer days were like this. You got up of a morning. Um, we probably, as the boys, we probably didn't get up till 6 or 6.30 most mornings. But we had chores to do. There was always livestock to feed. There was barns to clean out. We did work in the garden with, with mom and everything. Uh, I remember going and pick blackberries, you know, uh, and, and things like that. Uh, I remember walking down to, uh, to one of our woods where we had cattle. We had an old pitcher pump uh, in the creek and we would pump water for the cattle in that particular part of the, of the woods when the, when the creek would run, that particular creek would run dry, we'd pump water. Um, we were always outside. Uh, I guess those was always some of the good things. We were always outside. We, we lived on a farm that had a lot of woods and, and when we weren't, not that we worked all the time, but we had a lot of playtime that, that we could run up and down the woods. Uh, we'd find a grapevine and, and swing on it. Uh, we would make forts. Uh, uh, we always had a hay mow. Of course, to have, to have hay in the hay mow, you had to bale hay, which was labor intensive. But uh, there was always those aspects. We always had uh, the livestock. We always always had cats around. Uh, uh, learned how to, to milk a cow. Uh, you know those kind of things. You learned a lot about life and death on a farm. Uh, when before we had what we call in the industry a farrowing crate. We would put a mother sow that was going to deliver her babies, we would put her in a square pen and we would corner off one corner and, and hang a heat lamp there for warmth, but she would make a nest with the, with the straw bedding and she would lay down and she would start to have her babies. And then maybe she would stand right up and if you weren't there to watch, she just decided in, in labor she'd lay right back down and she might lay on her baby. So we saw life we saw life, which is really cool, and we saw death. Uh, why and how come and, and what happened. And, and it makes you appreciate 
a lot more about what life is and, and how valuable it is. And, but it is just a fact of life that you have life and death on, on, on the farm. But, uh, uh, but we, had, we had gardens. We had, we had cricks we could play in. Um, we, we just got to run around a lot. Um, but we, but we, we, we worked hard. There was always those summer jobs. There was always fence, fence to build. There just those continual things on the farm. Uh, when we got, uh, as we got into school, uh, we did not have to get up and do chores before we went to school. But as soon as we got home, there were chores to do. There was just, uh, there was always work to do. Uh, uh, summertime, wintertime with livestock, always, always those chores to do. Um, I guess my, some of my be best memories are just uh, uh, growing up outside and uh, wearing shorts and, and going barefoot and, and um, ch we'd, we'd chase animals. Uh, you know, we would, uh, we, would, we would try to, we didn't try to ride any cattle, but the sows out in the woods, we'd try to ride on them, you know, and sometimes it was good, sometimes it was a bad. We, we'd all have a few broken limbs and arms and scratches and cuts and those kind of things. We got, we got tough when we had neighbors, you know, and, and, uh, we'd have chances to, uh, to, uh, uh, go down the road under the bridge over to the neighbors and we would play with, uh, with neighbor boys. We had, we had neighbors. Yeah. Uh, the road that I grew up on, there was only one family that had any girls, all the rest of us boys. So the girls were, well, it was, it was her mom and her aunt were the cherries girls in the neighborhood, you know, and I was fortunate enough to live just right down the road and we rode, we rode ponies together and they always had horses and ponies and we got to, to ride them, but we always had that. We always, we, we, back then we spent time as neighbors to visit with one another. Today, it's a little tougher because we're, we're always on the go and, and, with that, and that kind of and, stuff. And it, that's what I was, as you were sitting here talking about the things that you did like I feel like I'm on my kids to go outside they want to be inside you know on their phone or even you know reading a book over being outside or whatever it may be I, I have a hard time even getting them outside to enjoy it and you know a lot of values have changed um, from growing up on the farm to current day what are some of the values you've seen shift from farm life to today like oh. As far as family values and just your, your perspective on we, that. There again, when we grew up, fam, family was important, but we all worked together. I mean, it was a family unit. We all worked together, mom and dad and the kids. We were all there together. It wasn't like our, uh, our city cousins, given that terminology, that that mom maybe was a stay-at-home mom, but dad worked at a factory and, and that kind of stuff. And when Friday night at 5 o'clock, the work week was over with, and Saturdays you got to do things and go places. And, and if you worked in town, you got a two-week vacation that you'd take off and go. And, and growing, up, growing up out in the country with livestock and crops, you just didn't have those opportunities to, uh, to do that. The, the values I, that I see, the values that I gained and the values that I think my, my daughters have is the fact that growing up on the farm, there's those jobs and those responsibilities that have to be done. I don't care whether you don't like it or not, you have to do that. Uh, when I grew up, we had two channels on a black and white TV. That's it. There were no, and there was a party line. I mean, there were no cell phones, there was no electronics. But with that being said, our generation that grew up then we are the ones that gave the technology and all this stuff to kids today because we used our imaginations. We built, we built forts, we built guns, we fixed wagons, we, we, we made slingshots and we improved slingshots and we did a lot of those, we did a lot of those things and I firmly believe that, that that aspect of, again, what life was all about, what hard work was all about, about uh, being truthful and honest. Not that those can't be anywhere else, but they were so prevalent as, 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 as we grew up because family was the whole thing. And, and our family, on Sundays, we did not labor in the fields. We took care of the livestock. And, and uh, there was always the church time. And then Sunday afternoons was the time to unwind. And in the summertime, maybe after we got a little older, mom and dad would take us to the, the family pond. And we spent time fishing. Or, and I know that it was probably a dread on them. 
they didn't want to do that on their Sunday afternoons, but they would take us fishing or swimming, you know, in the in the family in the in the family pond. Uh, we also knew where our where our food come from. We understood if you wanted fried chicken, you got the chicken and you took an axe and a block of wood and you chopped its head off. You let it flop around and then you dunked it in the hot boiling water. You plucked all the feathers off and got all stinky. And But that was how you had fried chicken. And if you wanted green beans, you had to hoe the weeds and get the green beans and break the green beans. And, and if mom wanted help canning or whatever, that's how you got those things. That's how you ate. That's where your food came from. And so you appreciated it uh, a whole lot more. And my mom was one of those that you put it on your plate and you eat it. Whether you like it or not, you ate it. That was it. There was no discussions about, well, I don't like that. That's tough. That's the way it was. So uh, it's really funny. Uh, my wife grew up in town and she rode bicycles and went swimming and had neighborhood get-togethers and played kickball and softball and she said you must have had a terrible childhood <laughs> no I didn't we didn't know any better I, as I talked to everybody that grew up in my generation and grew up out in the countryside we didn't know any better I mean that's just that was just life that's what was expected and that's how we did it and we didn't complain because that you you didn't complain um because that's just but you really didn't have any alternatives either. And I think that's oh, no. a big change today is, you know, Jamie and I were just recently, our head librarian and I were recently talking about just our society and just the instant gratification. You know, if I want um, chicken, I can go to McDonald's or to, store, you know, yep. to the store and I can get that. I don't have to wait yeah, you for have the to wait. You have process, to get, yeah. Yeah. you know, to, to get there. And so I think that those dynamics have certainly changed our society, yeah. which then changes these large scale farms because the demand That's is true. so and, and, high. Yeah, I, I mean, and it's just sort of this cycle that there is, and it goes in cycles. And now we're back a little bit on the other side of that, where where we have people with the financial resources that you know what? I know it's going to cost more, but I want to know where my chicken come from. Mm -hmm. I want it raised outside. I mean, I've got three daughters like that that they buy at Whole Foods. They they don't mind. They have the financial wherewith that they don't mind spending it. But there is a segment. There is a segment that their income does not allow that. There is a part of the world that wants to be fed, and, and they want that product as, as, as uh, inexpensive as they can. And sometimes when I have these conversations with people, um, you, and I ask them this, you don't build your own car, do you? No. Well, so you don't have your own garden, so you've got to rely on, on somebody else. And so... And with that being said, there are those opportunities for those niche markets if you live in the right place and have the right clientele that you can go back. And, and I've seen that in some young farm families that do not want the, the modernization. They do not want um, high-end productivity. They want to go back to that simple lifestyle raise their kids out, let them see the values of taking care of animals and having chores and having responsibilities to do. I, I see that uh, coming back in, in certain areas and just kudos to them. But if you're going to be in mainstream agriculture, in world production agriculture, it comes back to using the technology and mass, mass production of those kind of things. So, but. Uh, the heartaches of growing up is just dealing with what Mother Nature gives you sometimes. And it's like, why? And how How come? Um, to, uh, to put all your time and effort and energy into a crop and the weather doesn't, uh, it just isn't there. And it's like, wow, you know, I put all my energy into this and it's not there. And so... Uh, so what we do is we cut back a little bit. I mean, that's just it right there. You know, uh, you can't do that. Uh, uh, the heartache of um, seeing um, young farmers or even older farmers that because of maybe circumstances out of their control, the, the markets, the, the, the interest rates, uh, maybe, maybe they haven't had the wherewith to 
to capitalize and buy real estate and they've had to rent it all from somebody else and they lose it and they have to sell out and go someplace else and and I've seen that happen time and time again uh, uh, a 55 year old man that's farmed all of his life and and not that he's not been good at what he does but because of those circumstances has said I can't do it anymore and he has to go um, find a job somewhere else the, those are some of the probably the things that that are hardest uh, on me right now as an individual just to, to, to see that happen um, but uh, anyway well thank you so much for coming today. Is there anything else that you can think of that you wanted to add oh to goodness. the I, conversation? We may have another opportunity to talk about some additional questions if we think of them. But yeah, I, I mean, I really, I mean, I, I, I can't, I mean, I can, I can go on for hours talking about certain issues and certain things, but to, to try to give you a broad scope, but I just, hopefully I've I, I, uh, instilled in you where I've come from. Um, I've, I've been blessed in so many ways. Uh, I've also had the opportunities to be very involved in some agricultural organizations, which helps me connect with other people from other places around the country, around the world. Uh, I've been very fortunate. Uh, uh, I serve on a, a, a local ag co-op that, that supplies fuel and fertilizer and seed and feed. It's one of the largest co-ops in, in the state of Illinois, if not the largest independent co-op. And it's really changed my business sense. It's opened me up to a whole lot of things. It's changed the way I operate my business uh, to be part of an organization that, uh, I mean, it's about a $400 million a year business and to make those decisions. And so uh, that's, that's just helped me tremendously to bring some of those ideas back to my own, to my own farming operation and, and to keep it, uh, you know, going, going forward. I love, I love being a farmer. I always have been. Uh, don't get me wrong, there are those times I have a broken finger because of livestock. Um, I've had broken legs because of equipment. Um, I've had broken ribs because of things. I mean, it's not that it's a dangerous occupation, but those things do happen once in a while. So, uh, but well, uh, if, if you were to give one final word to um, future farmers, um, what, what would be your advice to them? Uh, I'm trying to think of a young man right now. Um, persevere. Uh, work hard. Manage. Manage hard. Uh, always have a positive attitude. When things don't go right, when equipment breaks down, and I know it's hard to do, when the market stuff. Keep a positive attitude. That's that is the and enjoy, enjoy that you had the opportunity to be a part of producing food or fiber for somebody else, and just just enjoy it. That's, that's it. All right. All right. Thanks so much, Bob. You're welcome.